So, wow, it's really impressive uh, presentations. Uh, thank you very much. It, I'm really overwhelmed. I have been here with you uh, in the audience uh, since the beginning, and wow, it's really, really incredible. Um, one thing I have been thinking since you, we started this conversation this morning is that actually it's very interesting that to observe that there is a, a kind of a shift in this society, I would say, and you will see it perfectly in this, in this discussion, that somehow IT, computers, technology has shifted from, let's say, a support function to the people driving the stuff. So suddenly, technology is driving, you see. And then, so so this, this is really great, and especially great because this is my job, right? <laughs> so, so it's great to be a data scientist and uh, a data innovation lab, but suddenly we have things like you know connected cars, and now we try to see the behavior of people driving, pricing these things, and suddenly we're lost a little bit alone on uh, we having the responsibility somehow about all these you know privacies and, and things. So so I think there is really a, a strong tension and shift of this uh, responsibility to the tech people that are now driving the seat. So I think this is going to be kind of like the theme I'm trying to try to develop with you during our discussion. And, and before that, I, I just wanted to thank actually the Research Fund for this great uh, event. Thank you very much. It's really a great opportunity for me and I think for you to interact uh, with uh, people from the company. And uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to try to confront different things you have been saying today. Okay, so uh, I apologize if I sound maybe a little bit provocative or rude. And um, the rule is you don't need to answer all of you each question so that you, we can have more diverse questions. And I will try to open also the, the discussion to the, to the room, right? Okay, so, so, um, so my, my first question is really open. And it's the following related to what I was saying is, it seems somehow that the machine in the one hand is a little bit more fair. So if you think about what Laurent was saying is, wow, we have the blockchain, it's a smart contract, so this is much more fair because there's no human in the loop, right? In the other hand, if you have an algorithm which denies you something, well, maybe you're not going to be so happy. So it's really open question, I would say. Is the machine or the human more fair? <laughs> and since you laugh, you're the first one. <laughs> yeah, you start with a very easy question. All right. Um, so I think, I think, so the question is, is a human or a machine more fair? Of course, the problem is, what do we mean by fair? Right? Um, and so we can, we can try and reduce it to a simple question of, bias, which then maybe is amenable to a statistical analysis, and we could, you know, feel content and go to sleep at night knowing that we've decided who is more fair. Um, I think that, and this is teeing off your attempt to bring a big theme, and by the way, what a challenge to kind of weave together three provocative, interesting, but very different panels, so, so kudos to you. Um, I, I think the theme that I want to highlight, which touches on yours, is the kind of the thought that technologists and those who interact with technology are going to become arbiters of value and values for all of society. And so questions like what does fair even mean is a question that computer programmers didn't have to ask 10 years ago. And today they absolutely have to, right? So I, I don't know. I don't know who's more fair. It depends on the situation. Depends. I'm not one of these people who say it's not the machine, it's not the human. It's the melding of the human and the machine. I, don't think, I think that's a, a little bit of a cop-out. I think sometimes the machine will be more fair, sometimes the human will be more fair. And in many situations, it really depends on what you mean by fair. So how's that for a non-answer answer? <laughs> I can jump on that saying, okay, we had this question at AXA with uh, two cases. Uh, the first is using NAC to recruit people. So you know NAC is an app, you play games online, and it gives you like your cognitive uh, strengths and how you think, how do you react when you have to do something in a limited amount of time, and so on. And so people are not forced to do it, but in AXA US, they can do the NAC and share it. And you know it's a machine analysis of your behavior. 
And some people say, well, that's great. It's fairer than human because, you know, human look, uh, what's your name? Uh, how do you look like? Uh, where do you live? And so on. And some others said, oh, my God, that's such a black box. You know, how do I know at the end why I get the interview or not? And the same comes with robo-advice. You know, if you have robo-advice uh, for investment and so on, is it better to have a human giving you advice, but this human might be incentive to sell more of this financial product than in others because he gets, I don't know, a nice weekend in the sun? Or is it better to have the machine? So this we have really concretely in those two examples. And then comes, actually, the question is, what are the human ready to accept as something fair? Because if I am a human and I go to an AXA agency in my city to buy an insurance product, I know that there is a margin of appreciation of the seller. Maybe he has a good day, a bad day, but I'm, I'm, I'm used to that. I'm used to know that he has this margin and, you know, that's, that's part of the deal. But I'm not that used to interact with a machine. And I'm not that used to know that it has been pre-programmed. That is not, you know, just related to which day we are and what is our social relationship. And I think this is a pre-programming that asks us question. And that's the same metaphor when we have the MIT moral machine with driverless car. If I have on the spot, I'm driving and I have to decide what to do, it's different because it's on the spot, it's my reaction and it's intuitive. And where it's different when we have to pre-program fairness. And so for me, there's really those two aspects, the social acceptability of fairness and the fact that is it on the spot, is it pre-programmed, and how does it, how this timing change the discussion you have? So I hope it helps, but it's not giving the right answer either. <laughs> no. Just before Laurent jumps in, right, because I see the pattern, right, one, two, <laughs> it's going, next is going to be Laurent, but I just want to mention one thing is, it seems, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm busy, but you really believe that the future kind of insurance is going to be kind of robotized, right? And, and, and you may think that you know, parametric things uh, are very fair somehow, but then, for example, it may rain somewhere and you're not going to measure exactly in his house and he will, may have some more loss. Maybe not this person not going to be too happy. That's one thing that I see this is maybe in danger. And then you're going to have what happens in the market, right? Gambling was mentioned, but then you could say, well, what about insure against devaluation? And so then you have a market, and then you can have speculation, and then you have robots, right? Trading robots. And so which would be trading. I, I know you try to put some inefficiency in the system so that people cannot do it, but what, what, what's, I mean, I, I'm challenging because I think you really yes. believe it's going to be the future. Uh, yes and no, because uh, I, I don't think um, the answer is, uh, is it the human or the robot that is fair? I think the fair person will be independent from the transaction. The, the, fair, uh, the fairest will have no economic interest to provide wrong information. And in the case of uh, insurance, the insurer has potentially an economic interest to, to say there is no uh, problem and I should not indemnify. This is what some people think. And there is the case of fraud on the other way. Uh, people could say, uh, yeah, I have I had a problem uh, even, even if it's false. So I don't care if it's a robot or a human that, uh, uh, but I think that I, I need an independent party to be the one that trigger the indemnification. And I use Oracle uh, that is, uh, so my Oracle, so my provider of uh, information that will be triggering the indemnification is for now Flightstat, which is data. But I could really imagine that I complement Flightstat with some humans that will just call the airport and then plug some information into a system. So I can have a mix of uh, both uh, to run the best uh, independent party that will trigger uh, the indemnification. Okay, J just before Brian. So one, one thing is you, you mentioned, and this is quite related, you mentioned three pillars, right? I think it was uh, integrity, availability, and privacy. And it uh, turns out that this hill mentioned other stuff which was transparency, explainability, acceptability. And, and if you think about transparency, right, uh, well, how much can you tell the other guys what you're doing uh, if you want to be secure? So there is not a conflict there or something? 
Uh, yeah, I, I, absolutely. The kind of the the the, the conflict between uh, transparency. So I was going to bring up the the importance of transparency. You know, a machine can be either much more fair or less much less fair than a human, depending on what algorithm it's running. But at least transparency gives a, to whatever extent we can achieve, it gives us a tool to get closer, at least to ensure that the fairness can be evaluated publicly, you know, and, and we can kind of decide as a society, is this type of al class of algorithm, is this cl class of rules or decision or input information, um, you know, a legitimate or a, a fair or unfair way to make decisions. Uh, so, you know, transparency is absolutely critical there, but of course it's, it's also very hard to achieve uh, in, uh, while, um, uh, while enabling, uh, you know, kind of the use of these very sophisticated, you know, machine learning AI type algorithms. That's, you know, a hugely important unsolved problem that's not my area of expertise. Um, of course, I think I do see promise in kind of the, in the efforts to create, say, you know, explainable AI or explainable machine learning where, you know, kind of you might use a very sophisticated non-transparent algorithm to create a set of rules that can then be boiled down into something that, you know, becomes more transparent and ideally could even, you know, kind of that resulting set of rules could be embedded in, in smart contracts on the blockchain to kind of enforce the transparency to be able to, you know, kind of demonstrate to every, everyone that those are the rules being, being applied and then everybody can evaluate, well, you know, kind of is the output of the machine learning system, you know, something acceptable in terms of what we think is fair, uh, independent of how it was arrived at by, you know, the algorithm. So, you know, I see some glimmer, glimmer of hope there, but, you know, huge problems at the same time. That's not easy to achieve, so. Yeah, but uh, just follow up on, on what you're saying. It, it tur it's, it's, it's interesting enough that you are trying to address this for the machine learning part, but not for the encryption, for example, which is uh, the part that one, one of the part that you're trying to, to have, right? So is it true or, I mean, maybe some people are wondering, okay, well, if I tell people how I encrypt, then people may be able to decrypt, right? So can, can you say so some words on that? That, that doesn't, that, I don't believe that principle really extends into the encryption space because, because uh, you know, kind of in all the sta state-of-the-art established pra best practices in terms of cryptography, a very basic principle is if it's not public, you assume it's not secure, right? So all of the state-of-the-art encryption algorithms and security technologies are all open, uh, you know, and open, and, and we believe they're strong precisely because a whole world of very smart people has tried to attack them and failed. And that applies not only to the basic encryption algorithm, but also to the classic uh, higher level computer science distributed and decentralized algorithms, some of which I alluded to, such as, uh, such as Byzantine consensus, uh, you know, kind of where we have, uh, you know, we have proofs that, you know, if you build a system this way, um, uh, you know, provided the security assumptions hold, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it will be secure uh, in that model, and that's based on openness. Uh, you know, that's, that's secure, uh, that does not and cannot depend on keeping the rules secret. And so that's completely compatible with transparency, and you know, when it's done in the right way, it, it supports transparency. Just, yeah. just to, to add what uh, Brian has mentioned, that uh, the, one of the security principles, uh, good, good practice is the the principle of open design. So you, you have the systems, the, the algorithm should be open, the, the system design should be open, even the code, software, hardware should be open. The only information not open is the secret. The secret, your password, your secret key should be kept a secret. So the, the whole system should be open. Because the, the community have learned the lesson from many counter examples, the so-called the principle of of, de of design by obscurity. So, you know, uh, there are like uh, 2G, uh, you know, initially the algorithm was cl closed, design, and uh, later on, it, there were many problems being uh, unearthed. So the, yeah, open design is definitely one of the uh, security principles the community should follow. Yes, so, so 
So you, you, you're you claiming that uh, basically having open systems and a lot of people contributing in a collaborative way is going to make this thing, uh, the whole thing secure, but, but at the same time, I think, and this was actually your point, that code is going to be more complex, and you mentioned McAfee law about, you know, being more complex, and, and, and you also mentioned about before about the fact that you can have a lot of boxes and they have a weak link between them. So, so this molarity, this complexity, makes me wonder one thing, which is a, a question for Scott, actually, maybe you have an answer for that one, is, so if these things are getting more and more complicated, is how can we estimate the risk? And these things are new and open, and so on. how can we estimate the risk? I think it's good to come back to almost your original question, uh, which is fair, you know, a, a robot or a, or a person. I think we make data-driven decisions. So the more data we have, the more informed decisions we can make. Before we decide to create a new product to cover a new area of risk, we need to do our very best to A, understand that, B, try and model it, which is a biggest challenge at the moment for the insurance industry from cyber exposures. Um, and then create a product that is actually usable in the marketplace. And actually, when I say usable, I don't mean uh, that it can be sold. I mean that it's of benefit to the end client. And it's actually going to cover what its intended purpose is to cover. The cyber market has historically been, uh, it's been judged in certain part as not providing cover that it's actually intending to do. And I think we've had to make a big change in the last three to four years to do so. So for me, with new risk and innovation becomes new different types of legislation. With new different types of legislation uh, becomes new areas uh, that, that need to be factored into an insurance, pro insurance product if it's intended to cover. But with these new technologies and the fast pace that technology is innovating and, and coming to life now, what we need to ensure is that actually we are looking at the products in a way that can, as in the insurance products, that can be delivered and be consistent through a life cycle of a client. And that's one thing right now that, because of the fast-paced innovation, is very difficult to do. Can I ask Scott a follow-up question? Yeah. So this is this is great. Um, I. I, I'm curious, as, as an outsider to the insurance industry, what is the state of the art uh, in terms of what you do, what you can do, and what you would like to be able to do in terms of designing and pricing cyber insurance products to respond to the nature of the way uh, the, the insured, so the insured customer or, uh, customer or person actually manages networks, manages data, you know, kind of to what extent can your policies and their prices be sensitive to, you know, kind of the extent to which the networks or particularly sensitive databases are managed with more or less state-of-the-art technologies and practices? It's a two-part answer. Number one, the, the, the current state. Uh, the current state is, and, is that it's been very much specific underwriter-driven. You know, building up a lot of knowledge, working with external providers that, to provide individuals with training. Um, over the past couple of years, we've started to see more uh, technology companies come up with uh, specific types of aggregation modeling, accumulation modeling tools, pricing tools. Um, because, and, and why is the market actually in, in getting uh, into bed with companies like this? It's very simple. They have access to vast volumes of data that isn't just our own. So trends, understanding trends, albeit the, new, the next threat vector we don't have a trend for. Um, but understanding trends to make more informed decisions, but also then to provide, you know, because we could have as underwriters, and I'm an underwriter at heart, um, you know, my biggest challenge every day is not picking up an underwriting file. But the, it, w w when I look at underwriting an account, it's based on my experience. It's based on a lot of research I do around the types of technology they're using. But there's not many underwriters in this space. It's such a, that we have such a skills gap here. So when you have such a skills gap, you've got two choices to make. You've, well, you've got two actions to take, actually. One is increasing the skill, uh, decreasing the skills gap, um, but also then utilizing external technology to, to be, a, be able to provide the level of support, data, trend analysis, accumulation modeling, so that you can understand it, it to, to a more 
uh, degree of depth the information so that you're trying, you're taking on a, a risk that you intended to take on as opposed to some unknown quantity. Okay, I, I want to go back to uh, change a little bit the topic to go one of the ones that are important going a little bit away from, from, from pricing, let's say. And it is um, the privacy topic. And, and uh, throughout your presentations, um, I was wondering because uh, you see my job is to try to identify people, not directly, but try to assess the best possible risk, and if I'm very good at it, I'm probably going to sort of like almost identify them, right? In, 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 in a long-term future, right? And at the same time, so your work is to try my life hard, and, and so my question is, is it possible actually to, be, to, to hide thanks to technology, or actually it's not possible? I mean, somebody mentioned this, you know, four data points, and then already you can de-identify. So maybe we should give up on trying to have this privacy. I mean, be private doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, we, you can, you can the only way to answer that question is to, to quantify and account for what we give up, right? So, so we could throw up our hands and say the game is lost. We live in a post-privacy society. Scott McNeely famously said, Privacy is dead, get over it. And this was 20 years ago. Um, but then what is lost? And you know, there are lots of ways to account for why we care about privacy. The one that I find most compelling, someone told me that there's a European scholar who calls this the concept of social cooling. Um, but the idea that we as individuals need moments off stage where we're not feeling surveilled in order to develop into the people that we're meant to be. Um, there's an individual loss if we can't do that. There's a societal loss. Um, one statistic I always cite is after the Snowden revelations, uh, an organization called PEN America interviewed 500 novelists and they said, do you sometimes hesitate to type things into Google because you think someone might be watching? Now, notice the question doesn't turn on whether they're really being watched, but it's just the effect of thinking you're being watched. <laughs> And something like 85% of them say, yes, there are things I will not search for because I'm afraid the NSA might be watching. Think about that. These are our novelists. These are the people who are driving the culture, driving our intellectual engagement. Are we ready to throw our hands up and say, okay, well, we might as well just walk away from the full development of our novelists? I don't think so. But of course, where does that leave us? That leaves us in this impossible struggle that's going to take a lot of action, a lot of participation, and probably will like persist till the day I die and then afterwards. Um, but I don't think I'm ready to throw up my hands yet, no. I, I'm not willing to take that cost. Right? Yeah, but at the same time, um, if we ask here how many people use Gmail, yeah. how many people use Dropbox, yeah. how many people use all these services, so it seems that in the one hand, people are very eager to say, yeah, we need privacy, we need yeah. uh, TV with cultural programs, and then people watch series, and, and actually give all their information up in the cloud. Yeah. No, I, I see more and more people learning how to protect their privacy. So for instance, I was in Denmark and I met a lot of people that have fake names on their Facebook or Twitters. And they have not one Twitter account, but several, one with different names. So there are more and more young people that play with their own identity to blur the line. So that's first example. Second example, there are more and more people that are interested in buying technology, protecting their own identity. So of course, we, we know that some of those technology, and you said is not accurate, but I think this is also progressing. Mm -hmm. And there are also people working on AI assistant to protect your privacy. So uh, there are people working on when you do a request on uh, Google, there are, I don't know, thousands and thousands of other requests made by you at the same time on Google. Those technologies are existing and they are coming on the market. So I think that uh, with human intelligence <laughs> and those technology, it might also change the rule of the game when it comes to what privacy means tomorrow. Yeah, uh, so I agree with everyone, everything that's been said. I also think, you know, kind of despite the huge challenges, privacy is definitely not dead. Uh, um, so in terms of, say, the re-identifiability of information, like, you know, if you have a whole, uh, you know, we've seen these extremely kind of ominous results that, you know, Paul uh, talked about, that, uh, you know, uh, if you have, if a, 
a whole a, a database of information is leaked or misused in the wrong way, there's a lot of uh, you know kind of re-identifiability problems that can that can happen to it. But we also have a lot of tools to ensure that uh, uh, that those databases uh, you know that can help ensure that those databases aren't leaked or misused and. Um, uh, and also just to uh, just you know uh, good practices like minimizing the amount of data and the types of data that uh, that companies need to store about uh, about individuals and make sure making sure that the mechanisms that uh, with which those data are are used are strongly protected yes. so so you know that's where I see a lot of the hope yeah, yeah but how much is this technology helping right if we take blockchain Right? It's so blockchain. Not, so now like blockchain, I, said, I can't trace back every single transaction. Current blockchains do not do this, like I said. So current blockchains, uh, you, you know, pro provide good integrity, distributed integrity, by making pri make, making the privacy problem worse. They they. Uh, work against privacy by spreading uh, copies of everything around, right? And so, yes. to uh, and they don't solve the actual, can I say, you know, distributed privacy protection problem. Now that problem can, is also solvable, but current blockchains don't do that. That's you know one of the things we're working on. Can I add, uh, <clears throat> add a little bit on the uh, on the technology aspect of the uh, privacy protection? Uh, to have privacy protection is really expensive. You know, if we don't have the privacy concern, our life will be much easier. But uh, you know, in the uh, in the uh, technology community, the the effort or the research in privacy has making huge progress in the in the past ten years. So, uh, for example, five G, a lot of effort are concerned with the privacy of the users, your location information, the network of cars. A lot of effort in the standards are on the uh, privacy information. Even when you have the uh, when you have the data, you encrypt the data, you upload it to the cloud, and of course the data you have uh, privacy protection because they're encrypted. Then the, the, the you also wants to have the usability of the data. So there were uh, research on homomorphic encryption that was started ten years ago, and when the homomorphic homomorphic encryption is essentially allows you to perform computation when data is encrypted. So the cloud will do the computation for you, but without seeing your data. But 10 years ago, it was first invented. The speed was horrible. You know, it can slow down the, the computation by one trillion times, can expand the storage by one trillion times. But today, has made tremendous progress. You know, the, the, the time is measured in milliseconds today. So I, I think the, uh, you know, privacy is important, because once you lost privacy, the loss is irreversible. You, you cannot uh, get it back. But I have hope on the uh, technology for privacy protection. And so when we are saying this, um, seems like, OK, let's, that you're more or less optimistic about the future. And since uh, I, there is in uh, machine learning, there's this no free lunch theorem. So I think it can apply here. So wh what's, what's the price of, uh, of these things? What is the thing we're giving up when we are requesting uh, privacy? I mean, I already see you, and you mentioned, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned your own, your own law, Ohm's law, <laughs> about the fact that there's no utility, but there are only other prices we're giving up without knowing. I mean, we're, oh, we want it, but what is the price? Yeah, so I don't know why I keep going first. It doesn't give me time to think of my answer, but I really want to jump in on this one. Um, so, so I think ultimately both of your questions lead to the same answer, which is we have to give something up if we really believe in privacy, right? I, I, I agree that there are technological solutions. We didn't mention differential privacy yet. You and I had a nice chat about that yesterday. Um, there are ways at the margins to protect privacy better than we do today. But ultimately, fundamentally, if we really believe that we want to preserve this thing called privacy that we've had for a long time, it's going to require you know, every individual and organizations and giant corporations realizing we don't need it all. We don't need all the innovation. We don't need all the utility. We don't need the breakneck pace with which society is changing. I don't use Facebook, and there are moments in my daily social life where I realize there's a deprivation, there's a cost. 
Uh, I remember the friend from college who said, oh, meet my two-year-old daughter. And I said, I didn't even know you were pregnant. Um, because she no longer sends out announcements, she just updates Facebook, right? So there is a social cost to this as a corporation. There's a utility cost, there's a profit cost, there's a competition cost to being the one company that says, you know, we're not gonna hurdle headlong into this new techno technological space because of the cost of privacy. And I think it's just incumbent on everybody to talk about what those costs are and talk about what those deprivations are. Sure, it'll take you five minutes longer to find the shoes you want, and you might pay 10 euros more for those shoes, but is it worth it if we really think we're getting privacy at that point, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a cost, though, I think. Yeah, yeah can I? Oh. Uh, yeah, it's, it's also just a, just a key observation, you know, not being a cybersecurity person. It's, you know, 20 years ago, data was, was a byproduct of our daily lives and businesses. But now it's, it's a tool of, of all businesses and all individuals. We use our own data, we share our own data on a daily basis, most people. I'm not on Facebook either and I completely echo the comments. But when we have all this data, yes, we want to we keep, keep it private. We want to keep certain elements private, but ultimately probably half of the goods that we buy are because of the data that we've shared in some shape, form or another. Therefore, you know, organizations are using this data. Um, we use this data. We also, I mean, some employers look on social media now utilizing the data that we've shared online. Uh, so it's a tool. It's, it's not going anywhere. The use of data and the storage of data isn't going anywhere. Therefore, you know, I think we have to embrace, but be aware. I think there is no other way to look at it other than that. So. Yeah, so to, to kind of follow up, especially with uh, Professor, Professor Ding's uh, comment about, uh, so you know, one of the costs of these privacy mechanisms is going to be efficiency, both you know, computational efficiency, you know, you know, communication efficiency. It takes you know, more pushing bits around, more you know, computation costs to deploy many of these things. So, and that cost is hugely decreasing, but it's all, also going, going to remain non-trivial forever. You know, kind of. There's no way we're going to reduce that efficiency cost to zero, but I'm still optimistic because I, I claim we don't have to. Because in many of the applications, I would wager most of the applications, especially after we do kind of the minimization process, kind of think think and do careful trade-offs about how much data we actually want to process, what types of data we actually want to use as inputs. Uh, and you know, kind of reasonable answers tend to lead to system designs that, uh, in which the amount of data we need to process in privacy-preserving fashions using state-of-the-art homomorphic encryption, singleness, uh, secure multi-party computation, et, et cetera, tends to be you know, small enough uh, in many cases, so that that's, even though that little piece of the system is a thousand times more expensive than it would be in the non-privacy -preser preserving fashion, that's not the bottleneck. That's not, you know, nowhere near the cost bottleneck because it's a tiny little computation that happens in, mini in milliseconds that would have happened in nanoseconds, but, you know, if it wasn't privacy, -er privacy preserving, but milliseconds is so good enough that, you know, nobody's going to care. It, it's not going to affect anyone's bottom line, right? And so, there are tons of applications where already where that's that's the case, and you know the the efficiency of this is not the bottle uh, not the bottleneck, and you know we just need to kind of get it out there and deploy it, figure it, figure out how to deploy it in those contexts. Just before I open up the question for the room, because I see maybe you want to give you some opportunity to ask something, but I, I'm surprised you didn't mention. Um, the electricity uh, issue, environment, okay, fine, maybe you're going from, millise from nanoseconds to milliseconds, but this is not going to be one time, but like millions of times, and then we're going to have farms of doing these extra computations, and we already have a lot of people saying, well, actually blockchain, which is a good example, in which you have a lot of computation proof of work and so on, which is totally lost, right? I mean, besides heating a swimming pool, you cannot do much with it. Yeah, yeah. so proof of, proof of work is a very special thing. Uh, like, you know, kind of er everybody in the crypto, uh, crypt, uh, the, the, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain community that uh, really, in generally agrees that proof of work is a terrible thing that needs to go away as, as quickly as 
possible. Uh, that, that is, so uh, the point of proof of work is it, it should be called proof of useless work in that, uh, you know, kind of this is absolutely useless work that's doing nothing for any, uh, anyone and architecturally is completely non-essential and unnecessary to making blockchains work. It's, it's just one piece of one particular fairly broken obsolete consensus process for which there are many other much better alternatives that we already know of. So, so uh, you know, the public blockchain community is, is trying to move toward proof of stake and other, uh, other approaches to consensus those are, you know, those will happen. They will eliminate that source of inefficiency. Uh, and in the private blockchain world, you don't need, you don't, you never need proof of work to start with. If you, uh, if you kind of have a human level organization that decides in a reasonable way who the partners are, what the the servers are, are going to be involved in the consensus process, uh, none of these, you know, alternative reasonable designs require the proof of work. Uh, inefficiency that's causing Bitcoin to suck more power than Ireland, for example, right? So that's, uh, that, you know, can be and, and, you know, needs to be killed as, as quickly as we can, but that's a deployment problem, not a technology problem anymore. No. Okay, so some, maybe some questions. Enough. If not, I, as you notice, I will keep going. <laughs> yeah, there is a question out there. Um, Really great conversation about protection and privacy. If we take a customer-centric view, what I'm looking for is data access. So there's a lot of data out there, there's a lot of data on me, and I'd really like to see it. So if it, an example, if I call the Access Service Center in the US, they use publicly identified information that says, I live in Westchester and I'm married. Neither of those things are true. Will regulators move to a point where they move from protection as an expect expectation to access as a right. Uh, so in the European Union, we already have a right of access. Uh, this right of access means that, for instance, that AXA, a customer can write to us and say, I want to access all the personal data you have on me. And uh, we can send it in whatever format we want till 25th of May 2018. 25th of May 2018, there is a new right, which is a right to data portability, which means all our customers can access their personal data in an open machine readable format. So it means that they can write to us and say, okay, I want to download all the personal data you have on me. And it's not only the declared data, so it's not only data of birth or, I mean, address and so on, it's also all the logs. So if you have logs on when we had this person on the phone, it can also be all the driving you've made, if we collect all the driving you've made. Uh, and even more interesting, this access is, so the customer can download it, but the customer can call us and say, please share this data with this third party and we will have to do it. And sanctions will be really high if we don't. So this is for the personal data. And then for the non-personal data, the statistical data, we are convinced at AXA that we need to give data back to our customer. If we have really brilliant statistical analysis on some types of risk, we need to open up and use data to help the customer. So we are working on experimenting how do we share claim statistic data so for instance, how can we have a tool where you write down where you live and you receive information in, in this area, here is the level of statistics regarding robbery or any other types of claims. These are the two tracks that are coming up and this is the future. The future is going to be much more open than today. What, what, what I see as a, as a big challenge, and this is what you were mentioning, is, is, and this is very related to what you were saying, Paul, is that somehow for me all these things are Somehow we, we have boxes, so like black and white and, and black, and this this is this is identifiable. This is not so. But for me, there is much more a graduality. If you think about the question right now, okay, we have data about the person, but then this data was used for something, which was used then for something else, and which was used then for something else. So how much you have to give back to the people? So w what would be the law answer on this? I mean, it, there is no boundary for me. So uh, let me give you the comparative American point, which is quite different. And then uh, Cecile can tell you about the personal data, non-personal data question under European law. So ironically, what we're talking about was started in the United States. So 
privacy uh, scholars and practitioners tend to talk about the fair information practices or FIPS, which I think even Europeans acknowledge are kind of the underpinning. This was invented uh, at a think tank in California, but has never, ever, ever been a part of American law. And so some of them are the right to access. And in access, it's both what data do you have on me and what right do I have to correct errors, right? No, almost no American law implements that. There is one, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and the Supreme Court has recently said, you know, it's not enough to say that your credit report has an error. You have to show that this error has harmed you in some way. Uh, so even they are putting like hurdles in front of people who want to do the kind of correction that Congress said they could. Um, and so in the United States, forget about it. Like if the data is wrong. Now, you were talking about an AXA affiliate which is a European company, so who knows? This is a, this is a good law brain teaser. Um, but at least for an American company, an American customer, there's no such comparable sort of correction. So I didn't answer your question, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Very useful. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so the next to, question. To follow up on both uh, Paul and Cecile, I think these are extremely important points. In the case of personal information, uh, besides the uh, giving uh, people the ability to know what the company has about them, there's the, the other very important provision in the GDPR, for example, the right to be forgotten, the right to have your information uh, destroyed. And that's another very important critical challenge. I'm very optimistic about the GP GDPR being kind of a forcing function, helping to drive you know tech, uh, transparency technologies to, to kind of enable that. And th this is another area where I'm optimistic about blo the blockchain approach because you know current blockchains will not help with that but future blockchains can with the right development uh, can help ensure you know provide uh, 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 allow companies like AXA to manage data in a way that if, if a customer says delete that delete all your information about me they will be able to transparently show that yeah we have it's gone it's no nobody can get it anymore okay so I was just uh, trying to add that um, uh, f sometimes regulators are a bit uh, not uh, really uh, consistent uh, between regulations because um, uh, there's the GDPR and um, we should not keep uh, information that is not really crucial for us. And there is uh, insurance regulation and they ask me to, um, or we don't know, but uh, I asked my legal team uh, when I built Fizi. I told them I don't want the address of the people and by the way I don't want them to write that because it's it's wasted time and it's not helpful for me to provide this product so I want the flow to be as fast as possible and they said well uh, in our interpretation of the regulation uh, it's better to keep the address of the people this okay is the insurance regulation insurance so um, I have to do to take a very private information that I don't want to to take, and then I have another regulation that says me okay, but this is private information, so you you need to do everything that you can to store it securely and so on. But I just don't want it. So it's, it's weird. It's I think it's a very good example, and they are well aware of that. And uh, so in France, they have created a fintech forum where all the insure tech startups go and talk to our regulator. So when I say our, is the financial regulator. At the beginning, there were only the financial regulator, but now there is a cyber regulator and there is a data protection regulator. And they sit together in the room, and they realize, you know, that they they are not consistent. Uh, so I think it's it's also moving, and they all realize they will learn. Uh, and I think that uh, there is a big work to do to take all the old legislation and check if they are future proof. So I think all the insurance regulators should check. Okay, I say that I need to have this in uh, twice on papers. Okay, do I really need today twice on paper this contract? So I think there is really a legacy to deal with. And we are at this moment where we are transforming from the past and where somebody has to do it. But it's for them a lot of work. Yes, so literally, the, in, in a slight contrast to that, in the UK, we had the biggest change to insurance law um, for such a long time, uh, for nearly 100 years. So the Insurance Contract Act came in last August. And actually, one of the key points there is, especially in relation to data, but not necessarily data protection, it's actually more in relation to if I've underwritten an account, I've requested certain information, I've got that information, and then they've had a claim. 
say, six months down the road. And I look at my file and actually say, well, actually, you didn't provide us with X, Y, and Z information. If a colleague on a different line of business had asked for that information, could be on a different building, different floor, I'm still deemed to have had and been in receipt of that information. Therefore, I wouldn't be able to avoid a claim because the company has received that information. So the vast volumes of data that we now receive, we have to be extraordinarily careful in relation to, to the sharing of information internally, being careful then of the walls between what's, what can be shared and what can't, can't be shared. But with more and more different types of regulations means the more, more difficult complications, it almost comes back to encryption of data. And uh, is it usable, isn't it usable? Where do you draw the line? But there are vast changes in different laws. And becomes, for larger organizations, becomes much more challenging on implementation. Okay. Uh, so, so I started with the human. OK, and I guess I was finished with a strange question on, on technology. <laughs> about the future, and it's a sort of a mashup of all the remaining questions, so it's really strange. Uh, I think my question is, so, so some mention security and blockchain at the same time, some people start laughing, uh, and, and, and some people mention artificial intelligence, which is closely related to all the things we were discussing. So, so do you think in the future we are going to be able to ensure the blockchain itself? And are we going to be able to ensure artificial intelligence? <laughs> you see where that one's going, didn't you? Uh, look, uh, as, as my old mentor said to me, um, everything can be insured. Absolutely everything can be insured. Um, he did add a caveat to that at the right price. Um, but I think if, if the risk can be modelled uh, as we go forward, and we've got much more data than we've ever had before, um, as the risk can be modelled, there's also a crossover on the actual type of cover that would be needed to ensure that. It wouldn't just be a straight cyber related. There will be a number of other insurance products that would be needed, you know, IT error and emissions, you know, failing to do what it intended to do. Um, the, the, the cyber insurance, the actual, the potential of blended IT, PI, cyber and product liability, it comes all into, into the factor. So, yes, um, it can be insured, it could be insured. Um, is there a product out there for it right now? No. Um, but you've now given me the next piece of idea for innovation. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So this is the end of the public session. Then the privacy preversing, pre preserving uh, questions can be done during lunch uh, to this gentleman. Thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.